Good afternoon. It is always good to come home. And that's what the Mises Institute is. Uh, 75 years ago, if this book wasn't published, none of this would be here, right? There would be no Mises Institute. There would be no re rekindling of the Austrian school. Of, I, was, I was very honored when uh, I was asked if I could give a, a brief presentation today, and I decided, well, let's just pick the hardest concept of all of economics and go with that, right? So it's uh, the law of comparative advantage, or what Mises calls the law of association. And it truly is the foundation of human society and human flourishing. So let's go back, okay? And do you remember a time when free trade was cool? <laughs> the era of big government is over, right? Now, <laughs> it's true. It, it's true that uh, Reagan did impose quotas on the amount of Japanese cars that we could import, and the North American Free Trade Agreement that was negotiated by George Herbert Walker Bush and Bill Clinton, well, I mean, let's be honest, it doesn't take hundreds of pages to say, we won't tax, we won't regulate or restrict trade with you, right? So how free trade was that? But, it, but at least there was lip service to it, right? At least there was that. But today, there's a hostile attack underway. So Oren Cass wrote this. Uh, comparative advantage rose phoenix-like from the ashes of World War II as American economists sought to claim for themselves a leading role in rebuilding a peaceful US-led world order. But it's not just a hostile attack. There's an outright promotion of protectionism. And he says this. Now, this is January of this year. He says, behind some of the world's highest tariff barriers, the United States transformed from colonial backwater to continent-spanning industrial colossus. From 1870 to the eve of the Great Depression in 1929, U.S. GDP per capita grew at more than twice the rate of the United Kingdom. Most of the great success stories in modern development, countries like Japan, South Korea, and Israel, likewise hinge on aggressive trade barriers erected to develop domestic industry. Okay, and you're like, well, who's this, right? This is from Law and Liberty. This is from Liberty Fund. People who publish Adam Smith and Lord Acton and Frederick Bastiat and Mises, Law and Liberty. Hmm. So, who's going to champion free trade today? Is it this guy? <laughs> or this guy? So, what happened to the ideal of free trade? Well, the answer is the people. They don't support free trade. Now, why? Why don't people support free trade? And the answer is there's rot. Rot in the economic theory, or maybe it's better to say lack thereof economic theory. And the rot goes all the way down. So we need to start from first principles to get to the root of the problem. So let's ask the most basic question. Why should we trade? Why should we trade? So let's pick a guy. This guy. Here's Mises. He's got apples. Okay? And we've got this guy, Hayek, his student. And he's got blueberry preserves. Now, honestly, I was looking for a really nice picture of blueberries, but it, it didn't really work. So <laughs> blueberry preserves it is. So why will they trade, right? Well, when they trade, they only trade unequal values, right? Aristotle got it wrong. He was a smart guy, but he gets this part wrong. So look at Mises' thought bubble, and he's looking at Apples versus blueberry preserves. Now, in order for him to trade, what do we have to have? He has to value what he's giving up less than what he's getting. In other words, he has to value the blueberry preserves more than the apples. Okay. And what about Hayek? Well, 
Hayek is making a similar uh, weighing in his mind, and his subjective value has to be reversed. He has to value the apples greater than the blueberry preserves. Now, when this happens, they can trade, and you're like, well, that's kind of cool, right? So just as an aside, I did get a new computer recently, and I found all these cool buttons on my PowerPoint, like, oh, look at what I can do. So, <laughs> so if you're impressed with the transitions, that's why, right? <laughs> so when they trade, we can make the moral claim Right? There's no force, there's no coercion. Both sides win, and we're serving one another. Now, when I trade, I'm usually serving my customer. But who is that? That's a stranger. We're serving strangers. That's an amazing thing. But even after all of this, we still just have apples and blueberry preserves. Right? That's all we have. We want more stuff, not just happier feelings, right? So when we trade the apples and the blueberry preserves, it's true we're happier. Yes, it's peaceful. Yes, we're serving other people, but we still just have the same amount of stuff. They're just rearranged into higher utility situations. And that's where the law of comparative advantage um, or the law of association come into play. And if you're like, what are these things? Well, they're only some of the, the, the most difficult concepts in all of economics to wrap your mind around. So let's go for it. So the law of compared advantage is first put forward in David Ricardo's book, The Principles of Political Economy and Taxation in 1817. Now, Murray Rothbard says, maybe James Mill wrote that, that, that part there. I don't know, but it's an important part. Okay. Now, what Mises does in Human Action, 1949, is he broadens the scope away from international trade, and he applies it to the individual level, right? He brings it down to all trades, and this is an important insight, okay? And he relabels it. He calls it the law of association. Now, by applying it to every single trade, what he's doing is he's showing the necessity of free markets. That's an important thing. Now, before we get into the weeds of, of comparative advantage, or the law of association, then let's do a simple example where we already know the answer. Okay? So, who's this guy? Well, that's Justin Verlander. And you're like, who's that? He is an amazing major league pitcher. Um, he used to play for the beloved Detroit Tigers, but now, you know, oh well. He earns over $43 million a year. Oh, and he's married to a supermodel. So, you know, rough life. Now, <laughs> let's suppose that he is not just a fantastic major league pitcher, but he's also a really good baker, okay? And if he could make a cake, and let's say he could make that yummy, delicious cake right there and sell it for, say, $430 per cake. Now, that's got to be one good cake, right? Okay. But even if he does that, that still means in a year he has to sell 100,000 cakes. And if my math is right, because I did it this morning, it's 2,740, a little extra, cakes a day. Now, should he spend some of his time pitching and the other half of his time making cakes? Or should he devote all of his time to pitching and then just buy cakes? Well, you already know the answer. It's pitching, okay. Or, so imagine there's a doctor. Now you're like, who's this guy? This is my wife's father, right? My father-in-law. And he is a kidney doctor. Now, same question. Should he be doing doctoring, kidney doctoring, I don't know, exact tests and stethoscopes and so I don't know, tongue depressors, whatever they do, who knows. And do that all the time, and then hire his grandson, Stephen, to cut his grass. And some of you who've been to the, the other conferences may have seen Stephen. Um, or... Should he devote half of his time to doctoring and the other half of his time uh, cutting the grass? And again, 
You already know the answer, right? He should spend his time doing what he's best at, earning the maximum amount of money, and then hiring other people, even if he's better at both things, doctoring and cutting the grass. And even if Verlander is better at everything, both pitching and making cakes, they should still, both of them should still specialize and trade. Now, here's how the law works. So we've got to put some assumptions here because we're going to build a little model, okay? So imagine two people. We've got Rothbard and we've got Keynes. There's two products. We've got bread and garments, right? Food and clothing. Labor hours are the only resource. We're going to hold everything else constant. Now, Rothbard is better in everything. He's twice as good at making bread, and he's three times as good as making garments. Now, what does this mean? It means that they're going to have different opportunity costs. And that's going to be important in a moment. Now, we're also going to assume that even though they're doing this over and over and over, they don't learn from any of this, okay? They're still just operating at the same amount of efficiency. And we're going to put the clock at 24 hours, okay? So these are our assumptions. So here's our example. Now, I'm going to say for Rothbart, he's got 12 hours making bread, 12 hours making garments. Keynes, he's splitting his time 50-50 as well. In this time, Rothbard can make 12 bread, and he's twice as good as Keynes. So Keynes can only make six. In this time, uh, Rothbard can make six garments, and he's three times as good as Keynes, and so he can only make two garments. Now, add it all together, and what do we have? Six plus 12 is 18 bread, and we've got eight total garments. So far, so good? Okay. Now, let's suppose that Rothbard is getting a little extra hungry, and he says, I want more bread. Now, he's better at making bread than Keynes. Should he make more bread? But the answer is no, because his opportunity cost for making bread is higher than for Keynes. Now, you're like, I don't quite see how that works. That's okay. Don't worry about this. Remember, this is the hardest concept. We're not going to get too deep in the woods. I don't need you to worry about all of this. It'll be in the paper, okay? So in the book, it'll be all there. Um, but what it means is that you concentrate on what you do best at, okay? So we're going to have Rothbard concentrate on garment making, and we're going to have Keynes concentrate in bread making, okay? So I'm going to rearrange their hours just a little bit. So for canes, I'm going to shift it all from garment making, all of it into bread making. Okay, so when that happens, garments go down to zero and bread goes up to 12. And for Rothbard, I'm going to shift some of the hours out of bread making and putting it into garment making. And you're like, well, how do you know how much? And the answer is it's arbitrary because it's an example and I want all the numbers to come out really nicely. That's why. Okay. So when we do this, notice the total production. We still have eight garments, but we have two more bread. We have 20 total bread. Did they learn anything? No. Did I add more time? No. Was there capital improvement? No. Did, was there a reduction in cost? No. What do we do? We just specialized in their comparative advantage according to the law of association. And like magic, there's more. It's not actually magic, okay? Not magic, but it's like magic. And now we let them trade. And so the price is two garments for five bread. And so the total outcome is Rothbard gets 13 bread and Keynes gets seven bread. And so... If we then say, who won more? What's, what's a fair trade? Okay. There's no such thing as fair trade. Because when we look at it in terms of bread, Rothbard gets a plus one bread. Keynes gets a plus one bread. They both got the same thing. It's equal, isn't it? But if we look at this in terms of time saved, well, for Rothbard, one bread represents an hour of labor. 
For Cain's, one bread represents two hours of labor. And so if he saved one bread, how much time did he save? He saved two hours. And so Cain's actually gained more in terms of time or time saved. But what about in terms of garments? Well, in this case, Rothbard gained more. So to say, well, I don't want free trade, I want fair trade. No, that makes no sense. Who won more, the United States or China? In what terms? How do we measure that? What perspective are you using? You can't answer that question. It's nonsense. But what's the big takeaway? The big takeaway is that when we follow this law, we actually get more stuff. And that's huge. So what we have to do is follow our comparative advantage. Like, well, where's that, right? Well, when you follow your comparative advantage, what I'm saying is you have to follow your opportunity cost. Follow your lowest opportunity cost. Now you're like, what, what, what's the opportunity cost? It is your next best foregone alternative. So whatever the next best thing is, that's your opportunity cost. Now, where's that, right? Do I need this giant chart where across the top, right, I have 350 uh, million people, because there's 350 million people in the US, and down the, the, the vertical, I have good one, good two, good three, good four, all the different producer goods and consumer goods, and then X marks the spot. Do I do that? No. Nobody can do that. That's why socialism fails, because they don't have the tools that the market has. There's no way you can calculate this on, on a spreadsheet, no matter how fancy it is, or with all the fancy computers. But the answer is pretty simple, actually. So how do we figure it out? Where's my comparative advantage? Where's my lowest opportunity cost? Well, suppose we've got three identical jobs, A, B, and C, identical in every way except how much they pay. A pays 55,000 a year, B pays 45,000, and then of course C, 35,000. Now, which job am I gonna pick? This is not a trick question. <laughs> which one am I gonna pick? A, right, why? Because it pays the most, okay, fine. What's my opportunity cost? In other words, the next best foregone alternative. It's the $45,000 that I could have made if I picked B, right? So my opportunity cost is $45,000. Now, suppose that I got clunked in the head or something, I pick B, okay? What's the opportunity cost if I pick job B? It's $55,000 a year, right? Because I'm not doing A. And if I pick job C, again, it's 55,000. Now here's the payoff. When we take the job that pays us the most, at the very same time we're minimizing our opportunity cost. Do people naturally do that sort of thing? Just take the job that pays them the most? Yeah, they tend to, don't they? You don't need a big whole, whole computer array and spreadsheets and all this in order to calculate what, what the job that pays me the most. So following this law, then, is an essential building block of society and civilization. Mises argued that following this law of association is essential for the existence of society. That's a huge claim, isn't it? That if we didn't have this, there would be no such thing as society. The benefit is human flourishing. You see, in the first trade, we had two happier people right, Mises and Hayek, but we still just had apples and blueberry preserves. But when we specialize according to the law of association, we expand production, we get synergies, we get one plus one is greater than two. When I work in what I'm best at, and when you work in what you're best at, we cooperate and we become better than the sum of us separated. That's extraordinary. That's why there's civilization. That's why there's society.
So people follow this naturally. So what's needed? Just three things. We need true free market prices for monetary calculation. So you're like, what does that mean? What does that mean? Markets? Yes. Property rights? Yes, 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 yes. All those sorts of things. True free market prices. But what else do we need? No interventionism. Any amount of interventionism is what? Static in the price signal. That static makes the entrepreneur's job, the consumer's job, all of our jobs that much harder because I'm getting static. And I can't quite calculate where my best opportunity cost is. And what else? No inflation or monetary expansion. Don't do that. Because again, what does it do? It screws up the signals. And so the results of following the law of association. They're pretty important. You see, society exists because we can specialize and divide up labor. Society exists because I can trade my produce with my neighbor. And we gain. When we specialize and when we trade, we're happier, right? That's Cain, uh, that's Mises and Hayek. But it's not just that we're happier. We actually have more stuff. That is the technical economics term, by the way, stuff. Don't, don't just use that haphazardly. <laughs> we have to have a pluralistic society. Even if somebody's better than everything else, it's not that I'm better in every, every way than someone else or someone's better than me in every way. It's that we are not equally better in all things. Now, in these two by two examples of uh, Rothbard and Keynes with two goods, right? Could you end up with the exact same ratio? You could, but with 350 million people, with how many different types of consumer goods and producer goods, you're gonna have two people that line up exactly the same? No way. And so what do we need? We need a pluralistic society where people are different. And as a result, those differences then, we specialize in our areas that we are better in. And that then leads to a peaceful, pluralistic society where we live together in cooperation and not just simply competition. And then finally, the... the other major result is the virtue of serving our neighbors. I have to make something in the market, not for myself, right? What do I do? I'm an economics professor, which means what? I stand in front of people and I go, blah, blah, economics, blah, 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 right? <laughs> and my students, when I tell them this, and I say, now I'm only producing all of this for you, and they look at me weird, and I say, look, do you think I get in my car home and I just keep on lecturing? No. Mostly no. <laughs> Often no. <laughs> I have a surplus of economics lectures for other people. And so I don't just produce for myself. I produce for others. I have to put myself in someone else's shoes and say, what do they want? I have to serve strangers. And after I serve them, only then do I get a return and I can go and, and get what I want. That's an amazing thing that I can serve others. And it's through that service that, that and, and how well am I serving others? Right? That's my profit and loss. That's my wealth. That's how I know how well I'm serving someone else. And then I can, I can take what I want after I've served others, strangers. So, one last note from Mises. And David Gordon was correct. Mises does write very long sentences. Not always, because the first one's short. Praxeology solves the problem. If and as far as labor under the division of labor is more productive than isolated labor, and if and as far as man is able to realize this fact, human action itself tends towards cooperation and association. 
Man has become a social being, not in sacrificing his own concerns for the sake of a mythical Moloch society, but in aiming at an improvement in his own welfare. Since this condition is real, we are in a position to comprehend the course of social evolution. That's pretty deep. That's pretty amazing. I serve someone else, I do so in my interest, and when I do this sort of specialization and I can work and cooperate with other people and we have this additive result, this synergy, we can build a society that's based on peace and cooperation. And we can create a society that flourishes. That's why the law of association is so important. Thanks. Thanks.